Um, welcome everybody um, to Scientists Warning Europe's um, Climate and Biodiversity Crisis Briefing for um, councillors and council staff. Um, we're absolutely um, delighted that so many people are here. We had to expand um, our Zoom webinar um, account just to accommodate everybody. We've had um, a massive number of people coming in on all of our sessions. Um, please note if you haven't registered for the two sessions coming up, that after this session, uh, there will be a session on success stories um, given by active and ambitious councils around the country, which will be very inspiring. And then in the afternoon at two o'clock, there will be a food strategy and nature strategy um, session um, with three more scientists um, talking about what we have to do in food and nature um, to get ourselves towards dealing with the climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, a very brief introduction to scientists warning. And um, for those who don't know anything about it, there were three scientists warnings to humanity. One was issued in 1992 um, and the, the key line saying that we were on a collision course with the biosphere. Um, that was signed by 1,700 scientists at the time, including the majority of the Nobel Prize winners in science. 25 years later on, um, the Alliance of World Scientists sponsored another article. So the World Scientists Warning to Humanity, a second notice. Um, which when it was issued said that all of the original scientists were right and everything they told us that was going wrong was right. It had just gone wrong quicker and in greater extent than they had predicted and that now the actions needed were even more urgent. Um, and that was signed before it was issued by more than 15,000 scientists. It's now about 20,000 scientists. And then in 2019 on the 5th of November, the day that um, President Trump um, talked about taking America out of the Paris Accord, um, the world scientists issued the world scientists warning of a climate emergency signed by 11 and a half thousand scientists when it was issued and now by almost 15,000 scientists. As far as we know, these are probably the most endorsed scientific um, reports or articles ever. Um, and that's the basis on which scientists warning Europe is working. Our mission is to make sure everybody knows about them and then drive science led action on the climate crisis. Um, all of the excellent scientists that are here today are all involved with Scientists Warning Europe. Um, they're on either our board or our core management team or in our advisory panels, um, each of them actually in a different role. And we're very grateful to them for that. And in fact, they are joined by another dozen eminent scientists, several of them authors of the Scientists Warnings and um, with several others who are in high positions in the IPCC. The original um, deputy chair of the IPCC is amongst our board members. Um, so, I'd like to then get us started. Peter Wadhams, uh, Professor Peter Wadhams will be leading off. Um, I will briefly introduce Peter, and um, Peter will then lead into his talk, um, and then I'll move on, briefly introduce the next scientist, and then he'll move on to his talk. So, um, Professor Peter Wadhams, he's a member of our core management team of Scientists Warning Europe, one of the initiators of the whole group. And um, Peter is Emeritus Professor of Ocean Physics in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. Um, he's an author of a book that recently came out in Penguin called Farewell to Ice. Um, his first degree was in physics at Churchill College, Cambridge. And while he was at college, he took part in an 11 month Canadian cruise, which was the first to circumna circum circumnavigate the Americas. Um, he studied for a PhD at the Scott Polar Research Institute. Um, he then returned to the Scott Polar Research Institute later on as a senior research associate. And from 1981, he was the assistant uh, director of research. He was then a reader in polar studies and was awarded an SCD Cantab for published work. Um, since 2001, he's been a professor of ocean physics. Um, Peter, thank you very much. Um, over to you. Hey, well, thank you very much and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, I, I, what I want to talk, to talk about very briefly is, of course, the climate crisis. And if we've got a climate emergency, which we have, then it is entirely a self-inflicted one. And this is the problem. This is not a natural thing that's happening to the world. It's something that we've brought on and which we can deal with. Um, it started because we, the, there's a natural state of, that the planet has about the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, in, if there's one level that we have during ice ages and a higher level that we have uh, during warmer periods in glaciers. So we, we have this level which is, happens to be 280 parts per million, uh, which is the level of carbon dioxide which the world would like to have if it was left alone. 
But unfortunately, from the 19th century onwards, it wasn't left alone because we started to dig coal and uh, invented steam engines. And we started to have an industrial society where we were burning fossil fuels uh, in order to provide the energy we need to run that society. And that the fossil fuel was initially coal, but then oil came and more or less took over in the late 19th century. Um, so we, uh, we went up from this, without knowing that we were going up, we went up from, from 280 up to higher levels that the planet had never known uh, in over a million years. Um, and we didn't know that it was happening. We didn't know what the cause was of the warming that was being observed until scientists, uh, right, as recently as 1896, uh, a man called Arrhenius, who was the great uncle of Greta Thunberg, so these things run in families, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he showed what it was that, that it was the carbon dioxide we're emitting from burning fossil fuels that was absorbing uh, radiation tr that was trying to, to leave the Earth and not being able to get back out into space, warming the Earth up. Um, so not, that nothing was done about that uh, until finally in the late 1950s, somebody thought, well, why don't we start measuring this and see what's going on? So uh, from the top of a, a volcano at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, uh, measurements started to be made from, and from then on we've seen this inexorable curve which frightens everybody who sees it, which is a curve of increasing carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere where the increase is itself increasing. It's an exponentially growing carbon dioxide level and nothing we can do seems to alter that. Uh, whatever agreements were made on climate didn't have any effect on the the, the carbon dioxide curve and even the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015 hasn't produced one little bit of faltering in this inexorable rise of CO2. And since our warming is due to CO2, this means it's an inexorable rise in our rate of warming. So we, whatever scientists, well, whatever politicians have said about agreeing to, uh, to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide or to, to get rid of carbon dioxide, we haven't actually done anything about it, uh, even in the five years that we've had since the, the beginning of this um, uh, Paris climate agreement period. So it's still rising and other things that are, are happening that are also rather frightening are that the second worst uh, villain in the climate uh, change problem, which is methane, is also being emitted now at an increasing rate. There's three times as much methane in the atmosphere as there was uh, before the industrial period started. And that's coming, listing, uh, it, it's leaking everywhere from industrial processes, but also um, it's leaking now from the seabed um, because it, especially in the Arctic where, where I do a lot of my work, that the seabed is warming up and, um, as the seabed warms up, there's a vast mass of methane that's, uh, un that's held under the seabed in the form of a solid methane hydrates, where as the seabed warms, the, the methane comes off. So we're having huge bubble plumes of methane coming out of the ocean in the Arctic, getting into the atmosphere and increasing uh, carbon dioxide levels, uh, sorry, increasing methane levels. So methane is catching up on carbon dioxide as, as the sort of villain here. And um, the first, well, the first things that scientists want to know is, you know, how on earth can we get rid of this stuff? Um, and for methane, there are real problems. It, it does disappear eventually. And um, if in the past, there have maybe been great methane outbursts from the ocean, which went away because the methane gets oxidized in the atmosphere and disappears. Uh, then if, if it doesn't keep on coming out, you don't know if, that it was there. But um, carbon dioxide stays around forever. And this is something that people didn't realize at first. They thought, well, if we stop emitting carbon dioxide, then it'll all gradually go away, won't, won't it? The answer is no, it won't. It's been, it stays around for thousands of years in the atmosphere and the ocean and, and the, the, end, 
the energy system of the world. So our problem is that um, if we can find ways to get rid of methane, and, and we probably can, then we, we can beat the sort of methane problem. But with carbon dioxide, we've actually got to get rid of it out of the atmosphere. We can't slow down our emissions and expect that that will do the job. And I think the big mistake at the moment that's been made by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and really all the climate change observers, or many of them, are that they say, let's just reduce our emissions. Of course, we have to do that, but uh, if we reduce our emissions, we'll be okay. Um, and that means switching to electric vehicles, uh, insulating houses more adequately, um, changing the ways in which we, we, we eat because of the, the amount of methane produced by cattle. Let, let's be, become more vegetarian. Um, many, many things we can do on us as, as in local government, as, as people, um, as well as internationally by global government efforts like uh, implementing ways of getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But um, just reducing our emissions won't, won't in the end save us because so long as the, since the carbon dioxide doesn't go away, if we're just emitting less, we keep warming up. There's no way we can get the climate back to a cooler state by reducing our emissions, even if we reduce them to zero, as we're supposed to do by 2050, but where, as nobody believes we will really be able to do. But even if we got it down to zero by heroic efforts, then we still haven't solved the problem because the climate is still warming up. There's no way of getting it cooler by uh, any reduction of emissions. The only way is to actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that's possible. There's no, there's no technical reason why we can't do it. And a lot of research is being done on this now. Um, but it hasn't yet gone into a sort of implementation phase that it ought to be in. Um, that is to say, we can uh, uh, pass uh, air through uh, scrubbers like the, 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 such as were invented originally for submarines. Um, to, uh, to get rid, take out the carbon dioxide, then you have to put the carbon dioxide somewhere because um, at the moment we emit 42 gigatons, that's 42 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. And if we want to bring down the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere, we've got to get rid of at least that amount. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we, we do it by taking, taking it out of the atmosphere by these technical methods. And then we, we can pump it underground. At the moment, there's an effort to pump it into huge caverns in Iceland underneath the mid-ocean ridge, um, or turn it into something useful. You, you can do some more chemistry on that carbon dioxide and turn it into artificial limestone. So there's a company that's producing uh, rock, artificial rock out of carbon dioxide, and that that when you grind that up, you've got um, fossil, uh, carbon free concrete and concrete is one of the biggest enemies of the human race normally because the carbon emissions involved in producing cement are higher than, than with any other material. It's, it's really terrible stuff. But uh, if we can produce the cement using sand that's, that's been ground up from rock that's been produced from carbon dioxide, then, then we, we're actually get reducing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and dealing with this problem of, of producing cement and concrete without uh, making our climate much worse. So we have- Turn, one, one, one more minute, please. Okay, so we have ways of doing that. And, and what, what I think we need the story really, well, other people will tell the story of what can be done on a, on a uh, local government basis, but certainly on a, a global government basis, what has to be done is a massive increase in research and development and installation of systems that will take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And uh, I think that alone will save us in the long run. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. That's absolutely wonderful.
Um, we're now moving on to introduce Professor Dave Goulson. Um, <laughs> Dave is a member of the Scientific Advisory Panel at Scientists Warning Europe. Um, he's Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex, specialising in bee ecology, and has published more than 300 scientific articles on the ecology and conservation of bumblebees and other insects. He's the author of numerous books, I won't mention them all here, but um, the author of Bumblebees, Their Behaviour, Ecology and Conservation, published by Oxford University Press, and the Sunday Times bestseller, A Sting in the Tail. Um, he was Biotechnology and the Biological Sciences Research Council Social Innovator of the Year in 2010, given Zoological Society of London's Marsh Award for Conservation Biology in 2013, elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2013, given the British Ecological Society's Public Engagement Award in 2014, and the Zoological Society of London's Claravet Award for Communicating Zoology in 2020. In 2015, he was named number eight in the BBC Wildlife Magazine's list of the 50 most influential people in conservation. In 2018, 19 and 20, he was named as a highly rated researcher by Thompson ICI, and he's a trustee of Pesticide Action Network an ambassador for the UK Wildlife Trust. Um, really, no one else that we could be looking to for advice more on the biodiversity crisis. Um, Dave, over to you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks for organising all of this. Um, just bear with me for a few seconds while I uh, share my screen. Hopefully that'll all work. OK, so it's, it's my job this morning to, to talk briefly about the biodiversity crisis, which is an enormous subject, uh, and with my particular focus on insects, which are my kind of speciality, as you've, as you've gathered. But before I talk about insects, just a very quick preamble. We're all here because we know that we are doing terrible damage to our beautiful planet. It's an extraordinary thing. Um, we've so far named one and a half million species of animal and plant living on this rock with us hurtling through space uh, it gives us everything we need so why on earth aren't we looking after it better why are we creating this whole network of interconnected environmental problems we're basically being astonishingly irresponsible with our with our beautiful planet my focus is really on biodiversity loss um, we are now in the sixth mass extinction event. Species are going extinct faster than they have for 65 million years when the dinosaurs were wiped out by a meteor. But this extinction event is unique because it's, it's been created by us, um, uh, a species on, on the planet. Um, now, when people start talking about extinctions or, or biodiversity loss, they tend to focus on extinction events, which are the sort of obviously the dramatic end point of declining numbers of populations. But actually, I think in a way, it's, it's the declines in bioabundance which are more important. Um, so, and so I just want to share with you a few astonishing, terrifying statistics um, about how bioabundance has changed. Uh, the first one relates to this bizarre graphic here, uh, which I stole from the Guardian newspaper, which was from a, a, a publication that came out a couple of years ago, where they calculated the weight of mammals on our planet and um, calculated that 60% by weight of all mammals on planet Earth is now our livestock, mainly cows, sheep, pigs. And 36% of the weight of mammals on the planet is us, the people, which leaves, of course, 4% for everything else, all the wild mammals, everything from mice and rabbits through deer to blue whales collectively weighs just 4% of the total mass. And I think that demonstrates pretty dramatically how, what a devastating, dominating impact we're, we're having. Um, one other, I'll give you one more, terrible, no, two more. Um, uh, according to the uh, Zoological Society of London, global vertebrate populations, that's all wild vertebrates, mammals, fish, reptiles, birds, and amphibians, fell by 68% since 1970. So we've lost two thirds of all the animals on our planet in my lifetime, in a lot less than my lifetime. Or uh, another, another depressing statistic, so 1966 is, is famous mostly for England actually managing to win the football. <laughs> um, 
but uh, there was also a recent calculation suggesting, well, showing that the breeding bird population of the United Kingdom has fallen by 93 birds per hour on average every hour since 1966 when I was one year old. Isn't that terrifying? Anyway, um, mostly people working in the, in the biodiversity and conservation field tend to focus on, uh, on vertebrates, the big stuff, the mammals and birds and so on, the kind of charismatic creatures that we all love. Rather less people worry about insects, but it's recently become clear that we should be worrying about insects because they too are in uh, rapid decline and perhaps even more rapid than the larger creatures. Some of the most dramatic evidence uh, comes from Germany, and that's what this chart shows. This is a plot of the, the, the weight of flying insects caught in, in what they call malaise traps. That's a malaise trap top right, looks a bit like a tent. Um, this is, this was, um, these traps were put all over Germany from the late 1980s. Um, and the biomass of flying insects in Germany seems to have fallen by 76%. Uh, between 1980 and 20, 1989 and 2016, so that's a 27-year period, three quarters of the insects seem to have disappeared. And that should really worry us because insects are enormously important, uh, arguably more important than pandas or tigers or rhinos um, that we care so much about. Um, and this was put very nicely by a famous American biologist He's in his 90s now, E.O. Wilson or Ed Wilson, I won't read it all out, but he basically said if people were to disappear from the planet, it would recover very nicely without us. Um, but if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos, was how he put it. And I want to explain why I think he was right, very briefly, because I haven't got much time. So firstly, insects make up the bulk of life on Earth. Two thirds of all known species are insects. But then they're food for a great number of the other creatures on Earth, birds, bats, freshwater fish, uh, things like frogs and toads, uh, reptiles and so on. So if the insects disappear, these things will disappear too. But then insects are also in, important in so many other ways that are involved in more or less every ecological process I could think of, from biocontrol of pests to recycling dung and dead bodies uh, and dead trees and leaves and so on, keeping the soil healthy, distributing seeds. They pretty much do everything, which is why Ed Wilson said that the environment would collapse into chaos without them. Of course, the thing that they do that we, we, we understand best is that they pollinate. Three quarters of all the crops we grow in the world rely upon some kind of insect to pollinate them. Uh, and so we've become used to our supermarkets being uh, full of all this amazing variety of fruits and vegetables from all around the world available 12 months of the year. Um, probably not sustainable for many reasons, but certainly not if we lose our pollinating insects because things wouldn't look so rosy without the pollinators. We wouldn't have most fruit and veg essentially, and even things like coffee and chocolate depend upon insect pollinators. Harsh truth is billions or certainly millions of people would starve if we didn't have the crops that rely upon insects. So what can we do? Well, uh, very briefly, um, I'm going to explain what I think we could do or councillors could do in terms of the way we manage green spaces in our towns and cities and villages and so on. Um, more broadly, I think there's actually huge potential to turn our, um, uh, our, our gardens and our urban green spaces into a national network of wildlife friendly habitat. There are 22 million gardens in the UK covering 400,000 hectares and just imagine if they were all managed in a wildlife friendly way. Um, and if you add in all the, the other urban green spaces, the, the road verges, the roundabouts, the parks, the cemeteries and so on, you've got a national network. And I think there's, there's real potential here and it's already happening to some extent. It's a subject that I'm very excited about. So I've written no less than two books on this subject. Uh, Gardening for Bumblebees actually comes out on the 1st of April in a few days time, if you want to know a lot more. Uh, but very briefly, I'm going to run through what I would love to see councillors doing um, in the UK. But starting with things I'd like you to stop doing. Um, so stop doing this, please. It's madness. That, uh, I'm sure you can tell, is a little bit of vegetation that's been sprayed off with herbicide, probably glyphosate. 
why? This is just environmental vandalism. Those weeds were not doing anybody any harm. Um, so stop doing that, please. Plus glyphosate is a very probable carcinogen and we spray it in our streets and in our parks where our kids play, it's nuts. I would ban all pesticides in urban areas, go pesticide free. There are literally hundreds of cities in the world that have gone pesticide free. Uh, the whole of France has gone pesticide free in that they've banned their use um, for any, by anyone who isn't a registered farmer. If they can do it, why can't we do it? We should also get rid of peat from all horticultural operations and from sale in garden centres to, to uh, the public. Um, use of peat is completely unsustainable. It's essentially a fossil fuel uh, and its extraction does terrible habitat damage. So please stop using peat. Uh, there are perfectly good uh, uh, alternatives. When it comes to municipal plantings, avoid those horrible kind of gaudy annual bedding plants and head for traditional cottage garden flowers. Uh, that's actually a corner of my garden, but uh, you can attract lots of wildlife and have a beautiful uh, flower bed as well. Be more tolerant of weeds. Um, uh, the weeds are really just wild flowers that we've decided somewhat arbitrarily that we don't like. Um, and so stop, please, spraying off these beautiful uh, flowers when they've managed to poke up in the cracks in the pavement. Things like dandelions are enormously important for pollinators. Plant flowering trees in our streets, um, particularly fruit trees um, in our, and in parks too. I think it would be great if kids could um, pick fruit on the way into school. And of course, flowering trees support lots of pollinators. Um, don't mow so often. This is a really simple thing that councils could do. Reduce the frequency of mowing. You save petrol, you save money, you save staff time. And if you stop mowing, most mown areas will burst into flower like this one or you can plant them with wildflowers. This is uh, up in Stirling in Scotland, a road verge that used to be a very boring mown verge, and now it's full of life and it looks fantastic. Wouldn't it be lovely if every road verge in Britain looked like that and every roundabout looked like that? Finally, one last tip. Um, I would love it if we could make more room for allotments in our urban areas. Allotments are fantastic places for people to reconnect with nature, produce their own, uh, zero food miles, zero packaging food, and allotments are also very uh, rich in biodiversity too. Broadly, we need to do a better job of looking after our lovely planet. Um, I always think it's astonishing that we would do anything for our children apart from apparently leave them a decent planet to live on. Uh, so we can do better and maybe we should start by uh, looking after the little creatures that live all around us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. That was great. Thanks very much for all the um, recommendations at the end as well. That's very direct. Fantastic. I'd like to go straight on then and to introduce Professor Chris Rhodes. Um, Chris is a member of the board of Scientists Warning Europe. Um, Chris graduated from Sussex University, obtaining a BSc in Dipville there, and worked for two years at Leicester University as a postdoctoral post fellow. He was then appointed to a lectureship in chemistry at Queen Mary and Westfield College, London University and then moved to LJMU as research professor in chemistry in 1994. Chris was awarded a higher doctorate at the University of Sussex in 2003. He also established a consultancy, Fresh Lands Environmental Actions, which deals with energy and environment issues. He's advised on low carbon energy for the European Commission, has published over 250 peer reviewed articles and seven books. He's invited to talk at many international conferences and universities around the world, um, and he has his novel, interestingly, University Shambles, an interesting novel. It was a black comedy by Chris on disintegration, disintegration of the UK university system. And it was nominated for a Brit Writers Award. He holds fellowships of the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Linnean Society of London and the Royal Society of Arts. And he's chair of Tr Transition Town Reading. So pretty um, au fait with what's happening at local council levels as well. OK, Chris, thank you very much. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Ed. Uh, let's try and share my screen here. Energy. Well, energy is fundamental to everything we do, and having enough of it, and a, a stable supply, um, is critical to maintaining civilization. And we use an absolutely stupendous amount of energy, and much of that comes from the fossil fuels. So more than 80% of our energy um, comes from oil, coal, and natural gas. 
and maybe five or six percent uh, each um, from nuclear and hydroelectric power. And I should probably um, point out that uh, these numbers were drawn up about uh, 10 years ago, and they haven't really changed all that much um, in terms of relative proportion. Um, admittedly, we're using something like 13%, 1-3% more energy than we were at the start. Um, but uh, all that's really changed is that our renewable energy is now up uh, to 3.5% if you uh, add together solar and uh, wind energy and up to 5% altogether, and we're burning uh, less coal, down to about uh, 27%. So really the picture, we are using more energy and fractionally less coal and more renewables, but clearly we've got an enormously long way to go, 5% renewables, 80 odd percent uh, fossil fuels, about 15 billion tons of them we burn per year at the moment. Now, uh, what can we do at the, the community level? Well, I'm gonna talk um, to some, a degree uh, about what's going on in Reading. And this we're quite proud of. This is uh, Reading Hydro. What you can see here um, on the right hand side, this is on Cabersham Weir. And the installation is there. And these two holes, these are where the actual hydroelectric turbines will go when they're finally delivered, which should be in a few weeks. Now, it's been a huge project. It's taken eight years in the making from uh, really having the idea in the first case to all the negotiations uh, with the, uh, the council between various community groups, um, the, the people running the, the river, all of this. And it's, it's this necessity for great uh, connection and engagement that in some respects is more important because um, obviously not all councils have a river, but this has been quite a big project. And it's a community uh, benefit society and it's been funded by raising about a million pounds from uh, opening shares out to the community to uh, put money in and buy. So this is really quite nice, but you note that it uh, produces uh, 46 kilowatts of energy. And while this is fantastic, we really do need to consider what we can do at the local level in terms of the, the wider picture of how energy is being provided, both at the national and uh, global levels. Now, uh, from the Reading Climate Change Partnership, which um, originated from Reading Borough Council, its main players being uh, the council itself and the University of Reading, which are the, the major local uh, employers, we have the, um, the practical arm, which is uh, Reading Climate Action Network. And um, not going through the history, there isn't really time to do that. But in 2019, Reading declared a, a climate emergency. And from a strategy of cutting uh, Reading's uh, climate change emissions, carbon emissions by about 7% per year, the action plan now is to uh, make uh, Reading net zero in emissions. That's net zero by 2030. But among all the other discussions, there are a number of documents, um, eight different themes, one of which is energy, although energy ties in with everything else. But there is the conclusion that without some change in government's uh, funding policy, um, really, it might not be possible to do all that's necessary. So uh, this is going to be um, an important aspect. We've got uh, the Reading Community Energy Society. This attempts to put solar panels on as many uh, roofs in Reading as possible. But of course, uh, energy not used is the best kind of low carbon energy solution. And so um, retrofitting buildings, for example, this is a, a project that the council is uh, heavily involved with. Um, it, it certainly cuts the amount of energy being used, but it also helps to remove people from energy poverty. We also have a repair cafe. So rather than throwing things away, you can come along and get them repaired, which uh, saves on emissions and energy and all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, oil-free travel. The ready bike that is uh, still running a bit like the Boris bike in London. So certainly it's important to um, focus on expanding uh, walking and cycling traffic free zones. Um, the Reading buses are a bit of a saga, but uh, finally they, they're running partially at least on compressed natural gas. And um, the Reading wind turbine uh, rated at two megawatts. That's uh, almost as iconic of Reading as the um, the Reading Lion. Um, but it's proved to be about 19% um, efficient over 15 years. That's privately owned, I should say. Not quite uh, the, the optimum for onshore wind, but uh, we have this. Relocalization is important. Doing more um, at the local 
practical level. Being less um, dependent on energy, food, and all other things that we have to import from elsewhere, from across the world, it's likely we'll have less overall energy available to us in the future. And also when people get together, it strengthens community. You certainly build local resilience, um, for example, um, if you connect um, a local energy uh, production unit um, to a local consumer. So the Reading Hydro is connected by a cable to, to Thames Lido. So small scale local food production too is more resilient than growing food on massive farms. There was a document, a very salient document released by the Institute for Public uh, Policy Research, the think tank, about how communities can thrive in a climate changing world. There's the, the link to it there. The point that they make is that a lot of um, community activities, although they might not say a food growing project, they might not have necessarily been put in place um, to address climate change. They do, because in this case, you're cutting back on the demand for um, crude oil refined fuels, for example. So there are many projects that are uh, worth uh, looking at through there. Now, um, there are issues over whether we can maintain the global oil supply and for how much longer. And um, we're enormously dependent on hydraulic fracturing to maintain the global oil supply, the blood of uh, industrial civilization. And this has probably put us into a quite uh, dangerous situation. But um, various different bodies, including um, BP, the uh, IEA, the EIA, the American counterpart, and also the IPCC from uh, the climate, uh, the carbon emissions um, point of view, offer several different scenarios. Now, each has a business as usual, which basically is what uh, might happen. Nobody claims to be predicting the future, but what might happen according to current uh, trends. And really, none of them suggests we'll have much of a reduction in our demand for crude oil at any time within the next 10 years. And really, if we're going to go to um, the lower uh, carbon emission target, it really is going to need government intervention, polish, policy pushes. And also, for example, if we're going to roll out 300 uh, million electric cars and these uh, driverless shared vehicles, robo taxis, we need a lot of elements like lithium and cobalt, indeed in greater uh, provision than there is for them for all other existing purposes. And I would say we will need earth abundant elements rather than relying on um, materials that might be scarce to roll out the necessary low carbon energy system, will be, which will be mainly electrified to meet overall energy demand um, into the future. And really we need to start doing things now. Um, we make uh, most of our electricity from gas and nuclear and from coal globally. And we need to expand this low carbon energy supply. Um, otherwise, we're replacing oil effectively by gas, coal, nuclear power. So really, the expansion of low carbon energy has to come along with the expansion of an electrified uh, vehicle network. And also, we need a suitable grid and distribution infrastructure to actually carry all this. Now, I'm waiting with bated breath slightly. Um, in May, uh, there's supposed to be a report from the IEA, what we need to do to hit net zero by 2050. Well, by 2030, we need to basically increase our renewable energy by probably a factor of eight. Now, what this will mean is that at least 40% of our electricity supply is from intermittent sources, if that happens. So we will need storage capacity, batteries, pumps, hydro, and also backup capacity um, to maintain a stable overall um, supply of electricity into our civilization. Different governments of the world collectively have identified about 12 uh, trillion US dollars um, to bring uh, the economy back up post COVID. But of course, this has to coincide with a definite and permanent carbon reduction. It's really now or never, because the economic decisions we make now may set the course of the climate crisis, well, out to 2050 and really uh, for good possibly. So, so to summarize, we can only deal with the climate emergency if we have enough low carbon energy in the first place. Certainly to use less energy in the first place is the best low carbon solution. So we've got to be thinking about uh, energy efficiency. 
see, for example, we can't simply raise all the existing buildings to the ground and uh, introduce uh, completely new uh, high energy efficiency ones. We've got to work with what we've got. So retrofitting the existing building stock is very important. There are questions over how much and how quickly we can roll out renewable energy. And this is um, among the reasons for why nuclear power is being considered. Our government, also the Canadian government, is looking towards small modular reactors, not great big power stations, but ones small, smaller ones that uh, perhaps um, generate a tenth of the output of a, of a large one. And I mention it now because this could become important to local authorities if they're going to wind up with one of these in their backyard. Now, if you're going to expand um, nuclear power for all the other um, issues uh, as well, but how do you fuel them? There's maybe thought to be a hundred years worth of fuel, uh, mainly uranium fuel for the existing fleet. Well, okay, unless you find some better technology for extracting from poor sources, getting it out of the sea, or go over to breeder reactor technology where you use the uranium-238, uh, which mostly uh, goes to waste effectively, um, it's really going to be quite a problem to fuel it. What about the high level waste especially? That could become an issue if we have a lot of small modular reactors around, that's really gonna need to be taken care of. Or so if the, uh, your nuclear fuel is not uh, isolated in a few uh, centralized places, um, a lot of uh, distribution of it around, then there is a proliferation risk uh, potentially. Also, we need to manage a stable transformation from where we are now, largely based on fossil fuels, to this new um, plan B renewable uh, low carbon energy system. We don't want to be shutting down fossil fuel uh, fired power stations or the oil supply um, suddenly starting to stutter before we've got enough uh, renewable energy and this uh, stable uh, plan B, which can actually take up the slack from that. Relocalization strategies, in particular, reduce the use of oil uh, fuel transport, but also when people get together in community pro projects, it does build community resilience. Local production of food, energy materials, and oh yeah, as we're very familiar with the, in this present time, and which may, I think, become part of the future scenario, home working, traveling around, around less, using technology like this to communicate and uh, work together. And also there it's, is a... Uh, one minute, if you can. One minute. One minute. Okay, that's perfect. There is a nexus between water and energy that limits to energy growth. Uh, because um, nuclear power stations, fossil fuel power stations, use an enormous amount of water. And there are issues of water supplies anyway. And so it could be that um, how much available water we have sets the limit to how much fossil fuel energy we could expand anyway, and nuclear. And so renewable energy has much less of a demand for water as well, which would be another reason to roll this out in a stable way. Okay, that's me done. Thanks for listening to me. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, great, if you could just uh, take your slides off the screen as well now, that would be great. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Chris DeMeyer. Um, Chris is a member of our communications advisory panel at Scientist Warning Europe. Um, and in fact, it's probably worth explaining in this context that we specifically have that panel in order to understand how scientists and the science should be communicating their findings. So to some extent for us, this is the first step today in what we're doing. We're trying to make sure that the science gets properly communicated to get the most urgent and effective action. Um, Chris is a neuroscientist, science communication and policy co-production um, co expert, bringing knowledge of how brains and minds work to the communication of climate change, very appropriate for today. He runs communication and engagement training for environmental scientists and policymakers. For organizational development consultants, local community and organizational leaders, he designed a unique training to help them bring opportunities for meaningful action on climate change into their work. As part of the UCL Climate Action Unit, he provides specialized support for individuals and groups to collaborate effectively across sector and professional, brown, professional boundaries. He has facilitated partnership working between local councils and universities for the local government associations net zero innovation program for the uk china collaboration on climate change risk assessment 
run by Chatham House, he facilitates workshops on energy transition and climate risk internationally and in the UK. Um, he's worked with BEIS, DEFRA, Natural England and, and the Environment Agency. He's um, co-produced Right Between Your Ears, a documentary about how people can achieve things even if they aren't true. He's also co-created The Justice Syndicate, an interactive play about how we make decisions alone and in groups. And Chris is here specifically wanting to try and connect the dots between what the science and the scientists are telling us and the action we should be taking at local government level. So please, Chris, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so the one tip on, on the communication side of how we should be talking about climate change in 2021 is that we should talk about actions. We should talk about how do we take knowledge and turn it into things that we are doing and talking about action uh, by means of, of showing best examples to other people such that we can all get inspired by what we are learning collectively in, in tackling these crises. And I was very pleased to see that, that Peter, Dave and Chris all had examples of actions in their presentations. And that wouldn't have been the case five years ago. We would have been focusing on the facts and, and, and getting across the numbers. And now we're, we're all pivoting towards actions. So, I'm going to talk specifically about the Net Zero Innovation Program, which uh, we're currently running uh, between the Local Government Association and uh, University College London. And, and that's all about how can we scale up action and ambition and connect councils and universities and communities across the country together. And in 20, I'll first give a bit of background of how it came about. In, in 2019, when all the climate protests were happening, uh, Extinction Rebellion, the school strikes, my colleagues and I started to hear two kinds of stories. And the first one was from uh, local council meetings where citizens came to demand more action. And some of these were productive meetings, but some of them were also quite chaotic where activists were kept out of the meeting, but then snuck in and started to shout and, and, and these kinds of scenes were happening across the country. Um, but another kind of story was of um, colleagues in universities that we were speaking to who were joining these local action committees or emergency committees because they wanted to do something. They wanted to become involved in the local climate action work. And we saw examples of that in, in what Chris and Dave were presenting as well. I think they did that in their communities too. Um, but as the, um, with my colleagues at UCL, we started to ask the question, what can we do to make this less of a chance of cures, less of one uh, academic walking into a local action planning meeting at exactly the right time where their expertise can be useful and be needed? Because of course, there are many uh, bits of knowledge and expertise across universities um, energy expertise, civil engineers who know about retrofitting and building, urban planners, biodiversity experts like Dave, um, who have bits of knowledge that can easily be turned into action, but that currently, because we are working in our silos of universities and councils, that isn't that that transfer of knowledge isn't always happening. So um, we reached out to the local government association and we, we asked them, can we organize a workshop with you where we are asking uh, people to sign up in pairs, one person from a council and one person from a local university. And if, they, if people don't have a connection, if someone from a council wants to sign up, but they don't have a connection to a university, we'll pair them up for that particular workshop. So um, the LGA said, yes, please, let's do that, uh, because that sounds like a, a wonderful opportunity to to get more concrete ideas for, for climate action into councils. And um, we scheduled a workshop, but then COVID came about in uh, March. And then of course we had to adapt our plans. We moved it online, but in April of last year, we ran what we called Pathways to Net Zero, which was then an online implementation of, of a workshop where we had uh, pairs of university uh, ex net zero experts, for lack of a better word, coming together with uh, councillors or people working in the council who had certain needs. And that workshop was such an interesting experience for the participants as well as for us at UCL and the Local Government Association, 
that we said we want to do more of this. We, the, we think there is something here to be done to really make this systematic, this the way that we're building connections uh, from councils to universities. And so from September last year, we've been running the Net Zero Innovation Program in which 12 partnerships of uh, councils and universities have come together with projects that they wanted to work on, that they identified as something that they wanted to change as part of their um, net zero plan or climate action plan. Um, and, and each of these partnerships consists of one or a few people from the university, from a local university, and then uh, members from officers, uh, or sorry, staff from the council. And um, they're all working at the moment um, at, on delivering actual projects that are going to contribute to the net zero ambitions of uh, these councils. And some of them are county councils, others are city councils. It's a, it's a mixture from across the country and across different types of councils. Um, and what's also really wonderful is the diversity of projects that um, are part of this cohort of 12 projects. We got 65 um, submissions of, of, of partnerships of, of councils who wanted to be part of this. We could take forward only 12 and we sort of looked at, at maximizing that diversity of ideas such that we can then scale up the learning that comes out of each of the individual projects and, and spread out over the country. And I'll very quickly go through some of the projects that are currently running. So some of these are internally facing and are looking at what the council internally can be doing, not in terms of changing the boiler in the city hall, because we know that getting to net zero isn't going to be solved by just um, changing your own operation practices, but it's by the, the decision structures and the decision mechanisms that are part of, of what the council does. So for instance, in Cambridge County Council, they are looking at how can we uh, bring emissions calculations into our procurement scheme. This is known technically as scope three emissions. So how can we make sure that we can uh, make that part of our procurement decisions that we're trying to get our scope three emissions, the ones from the things we're buying, also to net zero in the long term. And uh, so that's one of the one of the projects that's developing. Another one is Eastbourne and Lewis County Council. They're looking at how can we bring community finance uh, systems into play to, fin to finance local sustainability initiatives. So they're looking at a particular solar farm that is going to be built in the area. How could that be funded with community bonds? And that's the, the project they're looking at. A third one looks at the decision-making processes, for instance, investment decisions or capital decisions that um, a council needs to make. It's north of Tyne. They're looking at how do we train our council staff and the councillors such that they can take climate change and emissions factors into account when they are making these really difficult decisions. Because believe it or not, that kind of training isn't really available at the moment in a scalable, sustainable uh, format. Um, other projects are more outward facing. So for instance, uh, South Gloucestershire is looking at how they can communicate best with the community about things like active travel, cycling and walking, uh, about retrofitting housing and so on and so forth. Um, Colchester is looking at how can they work with schools. And that might also be a surprising one that the council needs to be involved in that because there are lots of schools initiatives that are running and where organizations go in and help schools to become engaged in climate action. But what Colchester uh, City Council noticed was that some schools don't even have the capacity to engage with these uh, initiatives, these external initiatives. So as a council, they are trying to help the schools to build the capacity to connect to the existing um, climate action initiatives that, that, that exist. Um, another uh, Worcestershire, Worcestershire County Council looks at, at active transport and e-bike system, bringing that into the community. There's quite a few ones on retrofitting, as you might imagine. Uh, one of them looks at giving the council the skills to decide what kind of retrofitting decisions they need to make for first 
where is the lowest hanging fruit in the housing stock of the council that they need to uh, decarbonize. Others look at retrofit skills training. How do we get the right skills in the building community in order to be able to do the retrofitting? Uh, because at the moment there is a lack of, of enough skilled uh, builders to be engaging in all the retrofitting that needs taking place. Um, another council, Hertfordshire, is looking at care homes. How can we make care homes more energy efficient while at the same time maintaining or increasing the quality of life for the residents in the care homes? And then finally, um, there is uh, a couple of councils that are looking at um, other aspects of climate change. So for instance, um, Cornwall County Council is looking at how is climate change going to link with other concerns that the council we need to take care of, like health of the community and emergency responses of the community. So how can they prepare for the effects of climate change that are coming down the line and, and make climate change not just an issue for the sustainability department or the climate change officer in the council, but to make sure that the responsibility becomes part of the entire uh, council organization. Um, and then uh, finally, there's, there's two uh, councils that look at um, energy use in the home and can we help people to be more efficient if we are building efficient housing, um, it often isn't used in an efficient way uh, because we start opening windows when we're meant to be doing something differently or we don't use the uh, climatization uh, systems in our home in the correct way. So what do we need to do to help people use um, their energy uh, efficient ways of, of living in their homes, basically? Um, in all of these projects that we're running, we're, we're asking people to, or we're, we're focusing on the people side of all of these projects, because often there is a focus on the technological side of things, like the technology side of retrofitting, the technology side of changing to electrical vehicles. And the technology side is usually quite easy. You've got experts that you can bring in for that. But the people side, the way that people will be engaging with your um, technology that you're putting in front of them is often overlooked. And so a lot of initiatives that start from very good intentions don't come to fruition when they run into opposition, either from uh, members of the public or from colleagues within your council. So it may be that you've been trying to push for a long time for a certain action to be taken, and it, 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 it hits a roadblock somewhere. Somewhere in the council says, no, we can't do this. This isn't part of our remit. Uh, we're not going to do that particular action. And so it's to be able to deal with those people uh, components of the problem that we are running this particular net zero innovation program that we can collectively become better at uh, implementing the technology that we know exists but that currently isn't being implemented at the, the, the rate and the scale that is needed. Chris, so, one minute, please. Yeah, I'm about to wrap up. So I will in a second post the link to the Net Zero Innovation Program page in the chat and please do go and check it out. Um, but also a bit of a call to action. So if you're a member of a council, please keep an eye out for the second round of the Net Zero Innovation Program that we're hopefully going to be launching in the autumn or reach out proactively to the LGA and say, yes, we want to be involved in that. Um, if you're part of another organization, a community organization, a business organization, also reach out to us because we want to scale beyond the university council partnerships to also bring in businesses and other community organizations. Because there's other types of expertise that exist in these communities as well that is not being linked up to the council climate action uh, plans of the moment. So that's it on my behalf. Thank you. At your mute, your mute. Right, now I'm not. Okay, so try, thanks very much, Chris, that's brilliant. Um, trying to scan through all the questions in the chat, I've picked up a, a couple of areas I think that we might try and address first because they've had multiple questions on them. 
Um, and just to let you know, the we're going to go on the nuclear question, I'll phrase it in a minute for Dave and Peter, and then we're going to come to net zero for Chris and Chris, okay, and how we communicate it. So um, on the nuclear question, Chris did a bit of a summary already of the issues related to nuclear, both sort of positives and negatives. Um, I'd be um, pleased if the, on behalf of the panel, Dave, you might start um, with your thoughts on should we go nuclear or not? If we do, how? Um, and what should we be thinking about? And then particularly maybe at local council level. Um, I'm probably not the best person to answer this because I have essentially zero specialist knowledge on nuclear power. But my, my personal instinct is it's completely insane to go down this route. Uh, I think we're really, really poor at understanding risk of this type. Uh, we think we, you know, it's a, you, I saw people saying, oh, isn't nuclear safe? Well, clearly not. History tells us that at least twice there have been huge cock-ups people, where people thought it was safe and it turned out it wasn't. And the consequences are so dramatic for getting this wrong um, that it just doesn't seem worth the risk. When there are, if we poured money into alternative proper green renewable energy, um, we, could, we could provide enough energy without nuclear is my feeling. You're muted again, Ed. Sorry, being so efficient, getting myself muted every time somebody talks. Uh, so, Peter, if you'd be able to, to add some comments then, please, on the nuclear issue. Well, you're muted, Peter, now. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say we must live without nuclear because uh, there are... Uh, we, we should we, we should live without the kind of nuclear that we've got, which is highly wasteful, highly dangerous, water-cooled reactors bought at unbelievably expensive prices from the Chinese or the French and situated right by the sea so that they can be subject to any tsunamis that might happen to be around. So that obviously is, is out. But there are uh, smaller-scale, solid uh, powered nuclear like pebble bed reactors which are very small uh, uh, use use solid material and uh, are, and are much safer um, the, so there is a route a nuclear route which is much safer than the current one that's being followed uh, but uh, I would agree that if we don't need to go down that route we shouldn't because of the danger there are still dangers and um, the, the, and I don't think now we need to go down it. And just as we don't need to use any more coal because now we've got uh, solar energy and, and wind energy that are cheaper than fossil fuels, we don't need to expand fossil fuel use. Similarly, we don't need to expand nuclear uh, because there are alternatives. So as long as there's an alternative, uh, we, we should go for it. Right, great. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, Right. Now, people have been asking about net zero. That's a constant issue. I mean, Greta brought up the issue of real zero as opposed to net zero. Mm. And this is obviously both a practical issue about how much carbon we're getting out of the atmosphere, how much we're relying on offsetting, whether it's meant to be working or not, and the communication of it. So there's two issues here. I think, uh, Chris Rhodes, if we come to you first, um, thinking of net zero in the context of energy and, uh, and the carbon emissions energy is producing, um, how do you think we should be viewing our path to net zero? Also, do you think we should be including offsetting in our net zero or reaching real zero? Um, well, my understanding of net zero um, is okay. On the one side, we uh, cut back on our, our use of fossil fuels. But then on the other side, um, I think we should be restoring nature. Um, if we were to restore um, a lot of degraded forests, for example, then over time, uh, they would certainly uh, be able to absorb some of the, the, the CO2 from the atmosphere. You know, we, we are really in a situation where it's not a single problem of fossil fuels. It's not a single problem of uh, damage to uh, nature, to biodiversity. It, it's the whole system that is failing and we've got to start trying to heal this up um, from all different angles and from the grassroots level at the local level and also from the from the level of government um, nuclear power certainly is being seen as uh, part of the uh, 
the low carbon uh, energy solution, but there are attendant issues. But then, as Peter said, there are better technologies that might actually prove uh, much more useful than the, the ones we've um, uh, become uh, used to and afraid of. So I think it, it's a multi-pronged attack needs to uh, be, be brought about. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Chris DeMeyer, if you'd like to comment, particularly sort of focusing on the terminology of net zero, whether that's helpful or whether we should be moving more towards something like real zero. Oops. So I, I guess that very few of us know in reality what net zero means, or we, we probably have lots of different understandings of what it means. But the interesting thing is that as a term, it has really caught on in a way that no other term has in the past. And therefore, I think that it, all things considered, let's go with it, let's roll with it, because it is a term that is driving action at the moment, where other terms that we tried to sort of push in the past didn't have the same effect. And it's not because it's a, be a better one than, than the ones we had in the past, it's just because it came at the right moment. And so I can see it driving a lot of initiatives in different parts of the system, some of them good, some of them maybe not so good, um, but it does look like a lot of people are coming behind it, together behind it. And that's why from a communications perspective, it is a useful thing. Um, Chris, just to take you up just a little bit further on that, um, is it worthwhile that we actually find now thinking of councils, a proper way to communicate what we as a council think is net zero and should we be communicating it on the basis of all the offsetting we're thinking of doing and I just add one bit to that on the offsetting most people particularly members of the public have no idea what the offsetting is and if it really works. Yeah so I, that's a very good question so I when I said it's a good term it's a good term for professionals to come behind in councils, in business, in universities, in the legal profession, and so on and so forth. When it comes to a council communicating the public, do it through the actual practical things you're doing, not through the frameworks you're putting in place. Describe the actual things you're building, your, the, the, the projects you're taking on, the, uh, the changes you're making to how you run your council tell those stories and then say, we're doing that because we need to get to net zero by 2050, but don't lead or by 2030 or 2040, but don't lead with that. Don't, don't think that as a term, people will understand it in the same way as you have been using it. We've been there in the past, a term like sustainability was a buzzword for 10 years um, in organizations, uh, in, in businesses, but never really caught on in the community. And, and meant something quite different to, to citizens than it meant to people who were working in that space. So, um, so yeah, thank you for the question because it allowed me to clarify that distinction. When you're speaking to your citizens, do it through the actual practical things you're doing, not through the frameworks you're building. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, now, Dave, we've seen a, a number of questions bouncing around trees, and it's often one that comes up at council level as well. Um, and I think the, um, if you could just shed some life on you know, strategies for councils or communities related to trees, because quite often what you see, particularly with smaller councils is, um, oh, we're doing a tree planting program. That's our work done. So maybe if you could shed a bit of light both on sort of carbon sequestration for trees and then the other biodiversity issues around it that are a bit wider? Sure, uh, yeah, it was an interesting feature of the last general election, the bidding war for who could promise to plant the most trees and it got a bit ridiculous. Um, and ill thought out tree planting can be quite disastrous, particularly for impacts on biodiversity. Um, there are already instances of, for example, the Forestry Commission has started planting big plantations of Sitka spruce in um, in the UK as they did back in the 1980s and they have uh, huge negative impacts on biodiversity. Um, so we need the right kinds of trees, we need native trees being planted in sensitive ways and actually allowing natural regeneration of trees um, it, through rewilding projects seems to be much better for biodiversity than us planting them in neat rows. Um, 
and we should also, I mean, I'm all for trees. I, I, I love trees, don't get me wrong. And they do lock up carbon, but we shouldn't forget that actually, I think people have a misunderstanding here. They think that trees uh, can lock up enormous amounts of carbon, but actually soil is a much better way of locking up carbon. There is far more soil currently, uh, sorry, far more carbon in UK soils than in UK forests. Um, so below ground carbon, focusing on that is more critically important. Uh, so I would like to see us focusing more on how we can increase soil carbon storage by improving management of farmland, pastures and urban areas. Urban areas store significant amounts of carbon below the ground too. Um, so I'm not saying we shouldn't have trees, I'm all for trees, but sensitively planted, not in, for example, beautiful hay meadows and chalk downland, that's a bad idea. But in the right places, carefully thought through, they should be part of a, a strategy um, to tackle climate change, yeah. I wonder if I could add a warning about trees of some things which we're just hearing happening at the moment in cities in the north of England. There's been cases where whole avenues of, of trees in cities have been torn down because somebody told them that uh, this interfered with the reception of 5G <laughs> Uh, microwaves so that we to roll out 5G so that we will we'll always know what's in the contents of our fridge while we're dr driving in our cars we're doing away with with large amounts of trees uh, so I think that's a warning that to resist tend, when you start to see trees disappearing it's often for a completely inappropriate reason of um, uh, the, trying to improve 5G reception uh, also on, on carbon, I'd, people shouldn't forget kelp. <laughs> in terms of, of huge, growing huge amounts of carbon and getting rid of it at a rapid rate, you really can't beat seaweed. I think I've, I've become a fan of seaweed from studying with it. <laughs> Great, thank you, um, Peter and Dave. If you don't mind, just I'll dig a little bit deeper, particularly may get another quick comment from Dave. But I just want to preface this actually with, as this is one of my pet topics on our parish council um, on tree planting. Um, and Peter has just sort of raised it. We go and cut down, you know, hundreds, dozens, thousands of trees, whether it's HS2, 5G, or somebody conferencing over their, their lawn area in the front of their garden and chopping the tree down. Um, and we know that your um, mature tree, so a tree of 40 years or over is doing about 20 kilograms of carbon um, capture a year, and that can go up to hundreds if it gets up to a very mature tree. Um, but when you are planting new trees, so us trying to make an effect for 2030 or 2050, um, for the first 10 years, trees are taking less than a kilogram of carbon per year out of the atmosphere, and up to 20 years, only well, generally less than two kilograms. So um, any, any thoughts from the panel on how we can stop the cutting down of our mature trees um, and get back to getting away from the idea of planting our way out of the chaos? I wish I had a, a, an answer to that one. I mean, it's, it seems to me fairly... Uh, one thing I, I get very upset about is, is the idea that you can mitigate cutting down ancient woodland, large trees, by planting some trees, as you say, they are not the same thing in terms of carbon storage and very much in terms of biodiversity. It, sure, if you wait 100 years, those planted trees might get back up to speed, but uh, we haven't got 100 years. Um, so I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I would um, regard well-established ancient woodland as sacrosanct and something we should not under any circumstances cut down, but of course, um, government at present wouldn't agree with that. So would anybody else like to make a quick comment on that before we move on? No? Okay, no, that's fine. Um, okay, we've had um, a number of questions as well coming in about incineration projects by councils. Um, so there's probably um, a couple of aspects on this. Um, on incineration, that's taking waste, incinerating it to produce energy, which all seem very efficient and wonderful until we look at the um, carbon emissions that come from it. Um, I wonder, Chris, on the energy side, if you might comment on the efficiency of it and maybe on how we stop those carbon emissions to make it worthwhile. 
Well, we've got a general problem with carbon emissions. Um, the only way you, you could cut back on that from an incinerator is by capturing the, uh, the carbon from the flue gases. And then you're in the same um, road with uh, doing exactly the same thing from fossil fuel fired power stations. Sure, um, it's good it to um, recover energy from all processes as far as you can. I mean, combined um, uh, power and uh, heating uh, uh, generation systems are very useful because you're not, you know, when you, you burn uh, anything really I mean, in a normal uh, sort of um, fuel station, you're throwing away nearly two thirds of the energy in the primary fuel. And accordingly, um, it, it's not uh, particularly efficient, uh, say, compared to generating your energy from uh, renewables. But uh, yeah, what to do with the rubbish? Um, I would say generate less rubbish in the first place. You know, really having far less stuff going to those incinerators would be um, a, a much uh, more practical uh, strategy. Great, thank you. And I'm going to lead straight in. I'm going to address this to Peter. So sort of following on from that, um, because, and I'll probably come back to you again, Chris Rhodes, afterwards for an extra comment. We're now on carbon sequestration and technical carbon sequestration methods, Peter, that you mentioned. A number of people picked up on it and there were several thoughts. The first one was that that is just distracting from the big picture. And if we start thinking about car technical carbon sequestration, everyone will keep polluting and keep consuming and won't change. But the second thing as to whether it's really practical and whether or not we shouldn't be thinking, particularly in the next five or 10 years, about every other method um, rather than you know, setting our sights on technical carbon sequestration. Um, well, I, actually, I, I'm a great enthusiast for technical carbon sequestration, and I think the argument against it is a false one, uh, which is let's not find uh, a way of letting us off the hook with uh, reducing carbon emissions, um, because otherwise people will kind of relax and enjoy life instead of being properly Puritan as they should be. And I don't really agree with that. Uh, I think if we can find a way that we can get rid of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bring the climate down to a level where it's not uh, causing terrible destruction, then we should we should do it. Uh, and the the one that that uh, I think is working would most because it's already in use uh, is 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 direct air capture, taking taking the carbon out of the out of the air and then uh, turning it to some good use rather than uh, just pumping it underground or something. You can turn it into uh, this uh, artificial um, limestone rock, for instance, or even turn it into fuels, uh, which seems daft because if, you, if you've uh, got rid of CO2 from the air, why then combine it with something else and produce some new fuels which you burn? But this really refers to aircraft fuel, that uh, so far we haven't yet mastered the way uh, to build large or even medium sized electric aircraft. So aircraft will have to be powered by fossil fuels. So if you can use carbon out of the atmosphere to produce the, uh, the fuel for the aircraft, at least you're carbon neutral in that area. Uh, but I, I think on the whole, taking it out of the atmosphere in whatever way you can manage, uh, either by direct air capture or by um, uh, other, other means you can, that are being developed, is absolutely vital. I mean, I think it, it goes way beyond the necessity for carbon emission reduction, which is a necessity, but it's, it's the only way that enables us to get back towards where we used to be rather than simply go forward into a nastier and nastier future more slowly. That, that, that's all that carbon reduction, emission reduction offers. But the energy costs are fairly high, aren't they, uh, for carbon capture technologies? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to be rolling out renewables to cut back on the amount of uh, fossil fuel uh, produced electricity already. We presumably need to use that same sort of renewable energy um, to power uh, carbon capture and utilization technologies. So all in all, uh, really uh, carrying along more or less down 
the fossil fuel line at all. It really does mean we have to roll out huge amounts uh, of renewable energy. And until the renewable energy system is big enough, can feed energy back and effectively build itself, we are going to be reliant on the fossil fuels um, to uh, subsidise it and put the energy in to actually uh, construct what we need in the first place. Um, uh, yes, well, certainly for carbon dioxide removal, you have to go to a place where there's a lot of free energy, mm -hmm. uh, renewable energy. So the, the bigger efforts that are being made now are in Iceland, where they're using mm -hmm. geothermal energy, and in the Rocky Mountains uh, of Canada, where they're using, um, uh, using energy from dams. Um, so yes, you can't, you can't do it everywhere. And it, which of course the same thing applies to electric vehicles. It's wonderful to say, let's switch to electric cars in Britain. Um, and I, in fact, we, we say that, but if the electricity for that car comes from a fossil fuel power station, uh, like Drax or something like that, we haven't gained anything at all. We, 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 we have to go, go to renewable energy. Yeah really before we switch to electric cars, otherwise we gain nothing. Well, that was exactly what I was saying in my talk, that there's no point rolling out, uh, say, 300 million electric cars while we're still using fossil fuels to generate uh, the electricity. Mm. I agree. Um, so really, it needs to be a combined strategy of electrifying the transportation system um, as we electrify the, the energy system overall. Of course, there are other issues of all the other raw materials and elements that we will need if we're really going to build a, such a huge number of electric cars and robo taxis, lithium, cobalt, and the BP um, energy outlook uh, from 2020. They look into this slightly because of all the oil companies, they really seem to be moving um, the furthest towards um, actually getting away from, from oil. And uh, you know, according to those numbers, and I, I quite believe it, um, we will need more lithium and cobalt production than we use for all other purposes. I mean, a lot more if we're really going to establish this large fleet of new electric vehicles. So it becomes a challenge, a resource challenge um, from all kinds of sides. And really, um, as much as anything, in terms of our deep dealing with the climate emergency. We really have an energy emergency that we have to face. And I think that's that's almost our most difficult challenge in terms of um, practical uh, implementation of technology, dealing with the energy side. Can I just bring in Chris Demeyer here to take a slightly different um, bent on this as well and keep the panel discussion going. Um, just seeing the time though before I do, um, are all the panelists okay to stay for another 15 minutes or so? Cause we've got mm -hmm. some other great issues to discuss as well. Is that okay? Right, great. Okay. Um, hearing um, Chris Meyer, hearing what Chris Rhodes um, has just been saying, which is obviously exactly correct, um, we hear a lot in all of our local communities and councils about, you know, electric vehicle charging points and all that sort of thing. Um, should we be turning the communication on its head and talking more about car clubs, walking, cycling, and trying to get completely away from the electric vehicles? Uh, a combination of things. So, um promote all the sort of example, good practice building in a community by telling stories of what people in the community are doing, how they manage to move away from their own car you used to walking or cycling or using smaller electrical um, scooters or whatever. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is um, promotes indeed the adoption of electric vehicles. And then by the combination of the two, you will reduce car ownership, you will reduce people using their cars. And at the same time, you'll promote the active transport that's healthier. And that is uh, also less of an impact, has less of an impact on the environment. So it's a combination of things. We need to do all of these things together. I wanted to add one thing to what Peter and Chris were saying. Um, and of course, there are huge, huge resource questions in all of this, the lithium and the cobalt, very much agreed with Chris on this. But if we are just looking at, at, in, at this in terms of how the technology, how quickly the technology is deploying and developing, and we extrapolate the rates at which solar and wind have been growing over the last 30 to 50 years, 
we just extrapolate those years, 10 years, uh, those rates 10 years into the future, then we've decarbonized the entire energy system by 2040. And that, is, um, that result comes out of a, a, a study that Oxford University has just completed, which will come out on the 15th of April. Uh, it's INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, that's going to release a report about this. Keep an eye out for that 15th of April. I think they'll, they'll release it. Um, of course, there's many ifs in there, the ifs of the resource extraction and whether we actually have those resources to hand that we can do it so quickly. But the way the technology is becoming cheaper and the way that these costs are dropping and the integration costs as well, the battery storage, the hydrogen, the ammonia that will go, that will need to be replacing all of the fossil fuels, the way that these rates are coming down will make that nuclear is not going to be competitive with any of these. Oil is not going to be competitive with any of these. Gas and coal will take a little bit longer, but not much longer. At this moment, solar has already a cheaper levelized cost than coal had in 2020 in many places around the world. That is continuing to drop and it will continue to drop over the next few years. There are additional integration issues. You need to make sure that the intermittency of these renewable uh, sources of energy is being dealt with. And for that, you need battery storage and other kinds of storage. But also those technologies are on a cost curve that keeps on declining. So we may be coming out of this. It, it may be that we're at this tipping point of, of solving that energy crisis. We may be running into other crises of, of the resources that we need to deploy those technologies. We don't know that yet. We have to drive it forward and see where we get. Um, it's not going to, uh, we're not going to resolve it by, by theorizing about this. We have to plan for it, drive the deployment, and then hopefully we'll resolve at least that particular crisis. Lots of other problems will remain, but that one might be solved. Um, great, thanks, Chris. And talking about aims and where we're driving to, there's been a bit of um, debate in the chat about targets, um, and it comes up in almost all talks. And I. I think I'd like to, to throw this out to Chris Rhodes, Dave and Peter initially um, as a bit of a discussion and then followed by Chris really um, to Meyer on the communication side. So what's the right target? You know, government set 2050, um, Extinction Rebellion set 2025. Um, and for those who don't already know, um, Scientists Warning Europe um, last month um, issued an open letter to Boris Johnson um, asking him to take leadership on the climate crisis and also suggested to him that the 2030 net zero target would be more appropriate, particularly on the basis that the Committee for Climate Change has shown that we can reach 2042 net zero and um, spending less than 0.9% of our GDP. Um, so really, just in terms of trajectory and aims, we're particularly thinking councils, we're going to have councils on here uh, this um, call which will have declared 2030 targets, some for their own emissions and some for their whole communities and others who haven't or have gone a lot later. And please, could you give your own thoughts on this? Um, so I think probably starting then with um, Peter Wadhams, um, moving then to Dave Goulson and Chris Rhodes, but please, if there can be an open discussion as well. And I was thinking, Chris Demeyer, you might come at the end more about how we then communicate that and get everybody moving in the right direction. So over to you, Peter. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like to, to, to draw attention to a, a real success story of a local council and energy and uh, to say well, that, that trying to, to set early dates for bringing about um, carbon free nation actually does act as a strong stimulus to these kind of initiatives. So this is Orkney Islands Council um, and Orkney has a lot of wind energy and not very many people. Um, so what they've done, and it's working, and it actually is making Orkney actually carbon negative at the moment, is that they, they have wind energy uh, stations in, on outer islands um, used to, to electrolyze water, produce hydrogen. The hydrogen is then compressed in, in tanks and is carried physically back to, to Kirkwall um, in, the, in ferries which is possibly a slightly dangerous thing to do. Um, and then, but then uh, they get it to, to Kirkwall Recon and, and then it's used uh, as, a car, as hydrogen power for local uh, government vehicles. So the, the local government is, is powering itself 
with hydrogen, which is obtained from, from wind energy in the outer islands. They can do this because they don't need that wind energy for, uh, for, for people because they, they've got more than enough. Um, but it's, it was completely an initiative by the, by the Orkney Council and they put it through and it's been a tremendous success and they're advocating it for use in other communities. Uh, so that, that's a kind of positive thing that I think is very heartening. Could I ask, is the hydrogen to be um, burned or put through a fuel cell to recover the energy from it? Uh, well, it's, it's, I think it goes to a fuel cell. It, it's actually being used to power the, 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 the vehicle, the, the public service vehicles of the, of the council. And they're like, yeah, okay, they're hydrogen vehicles. Yeah, like electric uh, vehicles, yeah. I mean, do they know what the, the input energy costs are? Because hydrogen is less efficient, say, than storing uh, electrons in, in battery technology, for example. So that, that, that is one issue if we were to really roll that out. But it sounds like a fantastic local project, I must say. Well, they, they benefit there because they have the one, the one European facility that we're still, we still keep, that we haven't thrown away, is the, the European uh, Marine Energy Development mm. uh, um, uh, Lab, which is a, a place where you can test out these various systems uh, on, against some cliffs. And, and, and generate uh, uh, electricity by whatever means you can think of. So that's a big stimulus is that, that Orkney is very conscious about, um, uh, about renewable energy. It's a, the, the people of Orkney are really keen and very technically advanced themselves. So you need, you, mm -hmm. you need public enthusiasm to make something like that work. Uh, Peter, there, just to bring us sort of back to the, the um, question, the um, public enthusiasm, does that need a direct aim? So 2030, 2040, 2050? Um, well, it helps. And, and with, a, with an aim that's close, the closer the aim, the more immediately you should be starting work. Um, the, the danger is that people will, will quote a date and, and think, oh, that we don't have to do anything for the next 10 years. Uh, and that's unfortunately what politicians have tended to think that uh, whatever date is quoted, it's it's it enables you not to do anything this very day. Um, um, Dave, I can bring you in here then on targets and maybe thinking also not just about net zero targets, but linked with that, the effect on our biodiversity and how fast we need to act on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think 2040 or is just way too late and shows a complete lack of understanding of just how serious these issues are. Um, so I, I would go for 2030, even 2025. Um, uh, I mean, and, and it's achievable if we really wanted to. This is what's so frustrating is actually we can change very fast if, if we show willing, if we actually realize, decide we want to do something. Um, and, you know, COVID demonstrates that if, you, if someone had said 18 months ago, we should all stop flying, you'd have been laughed at as some kind of lunatic. But actually, we did it. We all survived. And we don't have to go back to flying everywhere every five minutes in the way that we did before. So, you know, that's just a really simple example of how we can change very quickly um, if we want to. And we need, you know, um, we need to set really ambitious targets. I, I fear we'll miss them, whatever targets we set, because our track record with targets is really poor. Um, we've just sailed past the biodiversity targets of, of ending biodiversity loss by 2020, which were agreed internationally. We haven't even come close. Um, so we have to also be realistic about where, you know, the probability of us reaching any target we set. But the more ambitious we can be, the better the chance we'll actually achieve something before disaster strikes. Great, yeah, sage words, Dave. Um, Chris, do you want to add anything on the on the targets? Chris Rhodes, sorry, first. Um, yeah, I mean, the, okay, targets. I mean, the, the essential message is we have to act now. We really don't have any time to shilly shally about. We've got to decide where we're going to go and really start doing it. But what, what I was talking about in terms of relocalization, the more we focus on what we can do at the local level, as Dave just said, we really don't need to be flying all around the world uh, on uh, cheap holidays and so forth. I think it is it's going to take 
a strong um, mindset change, behavioural changes are going to be incredibly powerful both of themselves, but also in focusing us onto where we need to go, where we want to go as a collective human species together. I think this is very important. Our outlook Absolutely. needs to change. Absolutely. So, um, Chris, on communicate, Chris Demeyer now, um, a minute, please, on how to communicate these urgent messages and get the action. And I think that's both collectively as a council and then for councils for their individuals. You've already spoken a bit on it, but really with focus on the urgent action. Uh, it's by starting to do the action and then talking about the action. I've said it before, sorry that it's a broken record, but in a sense, the target in itself, whereas it, it's, it can be a focus point, is kind of immaterial what number it is, because yes, we miss them often when we set them, when you hear the sort of societal disagreement going on about 2025, 30, 40, it's almost like a negotiation process on a market where you're trying to buy a pound of fish. And so it's not the target in itself isn't going to get us anywhere. It's the actions that you know that you can start doing to get you to the target. I was recently talking to people from a large architecture design company, and they said, well, we've all signed up from top to bottom to a lot of declarations of what we're going to be doing as a company, but we don't know how to do it. We don't know where to start. We're working in the way that we're working, and we don't know how to bring climate into that. And so it's about discovering how you can be working towards your targets. And the only way to do it is by starting to do things. Do things that are not small, but doable from where you are at this particular moment. But think big, think ambitious. Don't think in terms of like, in three years time, we wanna see a 5% decline of something or a 10% decline of something. That's often how we work in institutions, we set these sort of small number targets. Think in terms of like, if between now and 2030, we need to get to net zero, what does that mean for all the schools in my council, for all the care homes in my council, for all the bits of nature reserve and parks and stuff that you're responsible for? What needs to happen to 100% of these things? And then see what rate of change you need to be achieving. And it will be far higher than three or 5%, the numbers that we mm -hmm. usually work with. But don't be disheartened then by the size of that number. Just start doing it. Find the right expertise. Bring that in. Start doing it. Start talking about it with other councils, with the, the public. And then collectively, we will start cracking that problem. We will start hearing all of these good practice examples that we've heard from Chris, from Peter, and from Dave that currently aren't common knowledge. They sit in silos in individual uh, communities as bits of knowledge. Once we start pulling it together, we will start to see how, as a society, we can transition much faster than all of us individually could have thought was possible. Uh, thank you, Chris. If I could just press you a little bit uh, more on that and your smile, because um, as you and I are both on our communications um, panel, we've had this debate before. So um, maybe I could just put it to you that the that the issuing of, a, of an urgent target, and along the lines that, that Dave has suggested, whether it's 2025 or 2030, um, focuses the mind, um, that the example of the company you gave that had no idea how to reach all the targets it set, by setting those targets, it started to question how it would reach them and what it should do to get there. Um, and I have seen that in my own parish council and in a number of other councils, um, they've declared not really understanding it and not really quite knowing anything, but it's urgent to do something. Then having declared it, everyone's gosh, gone, oh, what are we going to do? But started working on it and the plan has come out. So as part of the communication, don't you think it's important to set the target and then set to on answering the questions? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not against setting the target at all, but don't spend time debating what the right number is. Set a number and start working towards it. Set a number that feels achievable for your organization, for your community. Don't put it in 2050 because then indeed you'll be waiting until 2040 before mm -hmm. we start doing things. Set it five, 10, 15 years ahead into the future and then start working towards it. But there isn't, it's not an exact science. We're not going to determine what the right target number is for this. Just set one and get on with the job. That would be my suggestion. Great. Okay. I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think now we are well over time. So what we will do though is we'll, we'll ask everybody if you'd like to have a one minute wrap up 
Um, if you do have, and I always ask this question in most talks about silver bullets, I know there aren't any, but I like asking the question anyway. So if you were trying to think about um, a local council, what would be their, their silver bullet? What would it be? Alternatively, looking at it as where would be your big win for local councils, um, either in an area to focus on or in a way to start their action moving forward? Um, and I think we'll go back to taking the, the same running order as we had at the beginning. Um, so, Peter, maximum one minute, your, your final observations, please, and maybe a silver bullet or a big win for local councils. OK, well, again, I'd repeat this uh, taking uh, carbon dioxide out of the air and uh, that, that it can be done. You can, you can have pilot plants on, uh, that can be afforded by local councils, especially if they're producing something like uh, the, there's uh, techniques associated with cement factories or techniques associated with building uh, uh, limestone rock. That your council could be a, a shining example that it it's taking CO2 out of the atmosphere by an apparently expensive technique which actually makes a profit and if it's the first council to do that that could spread the word through the whole country. Right great thank you Peter. Dave? Uh, very briefly then I, if I just had to pick one thing which is always challenging because we all need to do lots of things um, I would say to councillors, go pesticide free, declare your town, village, city, wherever you borrow, pesticide free. Lots of other places have done it. It's a really simple thing to do. There's no particular downside. If you contact Pesticide Action Network, uh, they can give you advice how to do it. Brilliant. Short but sweet. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Chris Rhodes. Um, yeah, OK. I I'm going to follow that mantra that uh, the best form of low carbon energy is not using energy in the first place. So I would uh, suggest retrofitting buildings, draft proofing buildings is especially important. Um, if somebody's sitting in a draft, they tend to put the heating on. It, it makes a big, big difference. We've got a team draft busters in Reading who go around helping people to do that. Any form of relocalization, anything we do at community level, both uh, reduces our uh, dependence on vulnerability of supplies from elsewhere and tends to bring us together as communities. Fantastic, thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris Meyer. Uh, so my suggestion would be to think broadly and to make sure that whatever you're doing as a council doesn't sit only with your climate action officer. So bring in systemic measures into your council that make this the responsibility of everyone, your procurement team, your decision uh, makers within the council, uh, the people who work with schools, with care homes, with, with social services, uh, bring in the systemic measures that will spread the responsibility for action on climate change outside of the few officers that are working on it right now. Great, thank you very much, Chris. And I, I might just add to that, um, thinking of what Bristol's been doing, the actual action that Bristol took was actually to get everybody involved. So they decided it couldn't be driven by the council, but the council drove the creation of the committees for the city that are then driving the change. So it was a communication and collaboration issue, which is so important. Thank you so much uh, to all the scientists that are here today. Thank you so much for all the people that have attended the hundreds of questions. I know we couldn't get through them all, we tried to hit some broad issues that which were asked multiply. I hope that that was good enough to help a lot of people. Um, and we will actually have a review of the chat later on and see if we can deal with some, some more of them. And um, please do think of coming to our next couple of events. At midday, it'll be the success stories from other councils. So please come and join that, particularly if you're looking to copy and paste something or inspiration for what your council will be doing. That'll be four inspiring talks on action that is being taken by other councils. And then at two o'clock, we're looking particularly into food and related nature issues um, around food. So food strategy, um, food um, management, use of land. And that's also apologies to those who asked food questions, but it's why I didn't pick any of the food questions for now, because that will be being addressed at two o'clock by some experts in food and, and nature as well. Um, so please join us at two o'clock. All tickets can be booked on our Eventbrite channel that, or Eventbrite and site that you've already found. So um, thank you ever so much, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you to all the scientists for attending. Thanks for all your great work, not just in what you've done today, but the massive work the four of you are doing um, in trying to prevent the climate and biodiversity crisis getting worse. Um, thank you so much. So 
Goodbye to everybody and hopefully see you in the next session. Sure. Bye. Bye.